we have uh, I think we have a quorum. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's uh, Grand Round speaker needs very little introduction, but I'll just say a few words and uh, we can continue from there. Um, it is my distinct honor to introduce one of our very own Dr. Stephen Spar uh, for his uh, lecture in the Neurology of Laughter. Um, just to say a few words about Dr. Spar, um, he actually started a, his academic pursuit in a uh, with a PhD in aeronautical uh, engineering from Berkeley and uh, another PhD in physics from NYU. Uh, he then ventured into the medical field and earned his medical degree from SUNY at Buffalo, which was followed by a dual residency in internal medicine and, uh, at Boston Medical Center and a neurology residency at Einstein Medical College, where he was also a chief resident uh, in his time there. Uh, Dr. Spar was one of the very first fellows in the country in neuro rehab medicine at Cornell, uh, after which he held uh, several clinical and academic positions in several institutions. Uh, he was also a founding member of the Stroke Center at Monty. Um, he's extensively published in topics of stroke rehab and behavioral neurology with a keen interest in uh, the neurology of music. Um, and he also served as a PI for many clinical trials. <clears throat> his name also appears in uh, repeatedly in the popular science books like by Oliver Sacks and others. Uh, his long and productive career has earned him uh, several national and international awards and recognitions. Uh, Dr. Spar is well beloved by his residents and admired for his mastery of uh, the Socratic method of teaching with his captivating storytelling uh, which simplify complex neurological concepts. It's been a truly honor to, to be mentored by him. Uh, today, he will tell us about the neurology of laughter. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm sure it's going to be very enlightening for all of us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spar, for being here. You can continue. Well, thank you, Johannes, for being you. And uh, I, I'd like to say, since coming to uh, Maimonides downstate, I've been feeling nothing but welcome from my old friends, my old Einstein friends and my new friends here and the wonderful house staff that we have. And uh, you really made me feel at home very quickly. And, and thank you for that. Okay, so we, we began with a, 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 a Skype laugh track in case any of you have never seen this phenomenon of laughter before. It's kind of a bizarre thing, isn't it? Uh, First, uh, no financial disclosures, no off-label recommendations, and none of my grandchildren were harmed uh, in, in what you'll see to come. Neurology of laughter, is that a thing? You know, is that a field? How, how do you know something has arrived? Well, the way you know a field has arrived is when they have an entire volume of a major uh, journal devoted to the topic. And here we have the transactions of the Royal Society about a year and a half ago, uh, had a, a total, complete issue just to the neurology of laughter, the psychology, the neuroscience, the biology. It was edited by Fausto Caruana, who uh, lives in uh, Parma and is working on an entire book on, on the subject. Today, what we would like to cover is basically four aspects of laughter. What is laughter? That seems like an obvious question, but let's look at it in more detail. Why is laughter, what, why it has it de developed in the human species? And then the second half of the talk is for the neurologists in the room. Where is laughter? What is the wiring diagram? And finally, clinical cases in various subspecialties of neurology involving laughter. So when we begin with what, what is laughter? Now, laughter is an emotional response to a wide variety of triggers. It has a characteristic facial expression, breathing pattern, a characteristic vocalization, a posture. There are autonomic hormonal and immunological changes. And finally, when it really gets going, you lose your muscle tone, you fall on the floor, tears come out of your eyes, you have trouble breathing, you lose your urine, 
And here, get this. When it really get and after all of that, you like it. Now, how does that make any sense? How does a rational person look at this phenomenon? And can you find a rational person in this world? Well, we'll, we'll return to that. Ramachandran has said, of all the mental traits that make us uniquely human, perhaps none is more enigmatic than laughter. Let's start off with the triggers. We said there are many triggers. Now here, humor is the first thing we think of, but there are many other reasons why people laugh. Tickling, social laughter, just the very hearing of laughter causes you to laugh. Embarrassment. What could be in common between all these disparate uh, triggers? Facial display. We show our teeth when we laugh. In all of the animal kingdom, showing your teeth is usually an act of aggression. Is this an act of aggression? It's an enjoyable thing. It, is it an act of aggression? We'll return to that. Vocalization. You have this stereotyped five hertz vocalization that sounds something like this. <laughs> As all human vocalizations are most, it's on, you only do it on the exhale and it has a harmonic frequency. You can see these lines, I mean, this is the bass frequency. These are harmonics. You have a staccato burst of sound. And then at the end of the laugh episode, decrescendo goes down. Everyone has their own laugh. Every laugh is unique, but in general, we all do it the same way. <laughs> Now, here's something interesting, the autonomic responses to laughter. Um, here is uh, some uh, subjects being uh, subjected to laughter, and you can see this blue line, the pupils dilate, which is a sign of arousal and excitement. But the red line is fake laughter. Real laughter has less of an autonomic response than fake laughter. How does that make any sense? Whereas if you look at the dotted lines, fake crying hardly is more than control, but real crying has a major pupillary dilation. Could it be that real laughter brings down the autonomic storm? Well, we shall see about that too. So we say this is a, a, an emotional, a form of emotional expression. What emotion are we talking about? They, they call it mirth, but what is that? What emotion does laughter convey? All of these disparate causes of laughter, what is the emotion? Well, the first question is, well, how many emotions are there? Are some of them primary? Are some of them blends? Are some of them uniquely human? If any of you have seen the movie Inside Out, which is a Disney film, but it's a real movie. I mean, Paul Ekman, the foremost authority in the world on, on emotional expression, consulted on this. And it shows the inside of a, a young girl's head, all the emotions vying for control. Sadness, anger, anger is red, sadness is blue, joy is, is yellow. They've color coded the emotions. And if these are the primary emotions, can you have blends? Like on the color, can you put two of them together? For example, you have an emotion called schadenfreude, where you're happy for your rival's misfortune. Well, that's complicated because you're happy, it's joy, but sadness, you have to feel your rival's pain, and then you feel guilt about feeling happy about your rival's misfortune, and guilt itself is a complex emotion. Well, Damasio has uh, recognized the primary emotions as above and to which he adds surprise. But then he said there's another category of emotions called social emotions, embarrassment, jealousy, pride. And he adds laughter to that. You need someone else in the room in order to be embarrassed. You can't be embarrassed by yourself. And uh, as Tom Hanks found out when he was on the, the movie Castaway, you need someone else to, to experience the full panoply of, of emotions. He, he invented Wilson, his, his, uh, the, 
the volleyball that became his friend so he could have these emotions. And the teeth, let's get back to that. Why do we show our teeth when we laugh? When teeth, teeth, tooth showing is in general aggression. Well, let's begin with one of the theories of laughter. Some people, um, the Ramachandran theory is that laughter is a false alarm. It's, it starts off as a threat that suddenly dissipates. It has two parts to it. It begins with a threat, and then it feels so good when the threat goes away. Let's hold that in mind for a moment. That explains a few things about laughter. For example, if laughing is so much fun, why don't we just tickle ourselves all day long? Well, in order to tickle someone, you, you have to feel a threat. You know that there's no threat whatsoever in your, in, in your intention of tickling, but your boyfriend, if he does that, well, you know, you trust him, but not 100% there's the possibility that he means you harm. And so you laugh. And if a stranger does the same thing, you fight them off. That's a threat that never dissipates. Let's go through the development of laughter in children. Uh, babies cry at birth, but they don't develop laughter in, until about 20 weeks of age. And this is not learned behavior. This is innate congenitally blind, congenitally deaf, and congenitally blind and deaf develop normal laughter at the normal time. Anencephalics cry, they don't laugh. Implication, laughing requires some level of cerebral cortex. So how do you make a baby laugh? Remember, a threat that dissipates. Here's a, a young father, his first child, trying to make his baby laugh. I'm funny now. Can you laugh? Can you laugh? Can you go? Can you go? Ha ha ha. Can you go? <laughs> okay, the mommy is comes to the rescue. Now, uh, I happen to have studied laughter, so I, I, I know how to do it better than that. Here's me with my grandson. With his permission, I'm showing you this. <laughs> All right, the big crescendo and I was pushing me away. The laughing episode is over. The early pioneers in this field goes back to Charles Bell, who we know from Bell's Palsy. And we also know him from his nephew, Joseph Bell, who was the uh, prototype of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he, Charles Bell dissected the, the muscles of the face, which are gonna be very important in the facial expression of laughter. Duchenne studied these muscles electrically. And here he has uh, his subject. Uh, in, on the left, you see he's being uh, zapped with electrical currents. And on the right, he actually has true laughing. Now, what is the difference between true laughing and evoked laughing? You, the mouth looks pretty much the same. It's the eyes. In this uh, photograph, he looks terrified. But in this, he, true, sincere laughter. You cannot do this volitionally. You can only do this with the true emotion. And to this day, this is called the Duchenne smile, a true emotional smile. But the real pioneer of laughter was Charles Darwin. When he was old and couldn't go traveling around the world, he decided to study emotional expression. Now, when we showed Mr. Spock, we said, where are we going to find a rational man to study laughter? This is your rational man, Charles Darwin. By all accounts, he didn't have much of a sense of humor. He lived in Victorian England where you suppressed your emotions. And he was some thought to be on the spectrum. He didn't like to talk to people. He'd much rather, much rather write. So here is your rational man looking at emotions. What the, and he found out a lot. He would observe his grandchildren developmentally to find animals. He'd go to the zoo 
And to find out how people around the world laugh, he wrote letters to his correspondents in various countries. What did Charles Darwin have to say? Laughter seems primarily to be the expression of mere joy or happiness. We clearly see this in children at play. Idiots and imbecile persons, I don't think we would say that this way in the, in the current era, likewise afford evidence that smiling or laughing represents joy. Now, here we get to the nitty gritty. Many curious discussions have been written on the causes of laughter in grown up persons. The subject is extremely complex. He realized that. Something incongruous or unaccountable, exciting surprise, a sense of superiority. And then he talks about the tooth showing display. It's equally obscure why the corners of the mouth are retracted. And he talked about the development that age 113 days, these little noises assumed a slightly different character, incipient laughter. And at the zoo, he found anthropoid apes utter a reiterated sound corresponding to our laughter when tickled, especially under their armpits. And then he wanted to find out, is this true all over the world? Do people all over the world laugh the same way? I was anxious to know whether tears are freely shed during excessive laughter by most races of men. And I hear from my correspondents that this is the case. One instance was observed with Hindus and they themselves said that often occurred. So it is with the Chinese and the women of the wild tribe of the Malays in the Malacca Peninsula sometimes shed tears when they laugh heartily. Well, thank you, Darwin, for finding out that we're all human and we all have the same emotions and we all do it in the same way. What differs from culture to culture is what emotions you're allowed to display, which ones you have to suppress, but we, they're all there, all packed into that little heads of ours. Now we come to the question of why. What does this strange behavior do for us? Why do we laugh? And as Darwin realized, it's a complicated story. Why we laugh is very complicated in adults. The way we can, the, the modern view is to go back in time, phylogenetically, when we were a more simple uh, species. Uh, we have to go look at uh, laughter in animals in order to understand what happened in humans. So the question is, do animals laugh? Now here is a laughing cow showing the cows laughing. Is this, re this is not real guys, this is a cheese. This, the uh, cows don't laugh. What about horses? I found this picture online and the woman and the horse seem to be sharing quite a good laugh. And I, I didn't see much about horse laughter. And so I actually went down to Central Park and talked to the uh, horse drivers. They know a lot about horses. They spend the whole day with them. And I was fortunate to find this young lady who actually studied neuroscience in college. And in the evening, she works as a comedic actress. So she knew exactly what I was talking about. And I said to her, do horses laugh? Some wise guy walked by and said, nay. No, no, I asked, do horses laugh? And she said, well, they make a vocalization when they're happy, which is usually echoed by the other horses showing basically they're in a good mood. It's sort of proto laughter. And the particular horse she was driving that day uh, didn't do that. He was raised in isolation and he really had no sense of humor at all. Well, horses don't have full-blown laughter, they have proto-laughter, but these animals have full-blown laughter. Dogs, rats, this was a recent discovery. You can't hear them laugh because it's in the ultrasonic range. Dolphins, some species of birds, elephants. Here's a, the laughing sound of a baby elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very human, doesn't it? Primates, of course, uh, the, 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 cha the champion laughers, I think, are the bonobos who live on the Congo River. They're very affiliative. They love to groom each other. Um, they love a good laugh. And their laugh 
is different than ours because we laugh only on expiration, but the bonobos laugh on inspiration and expiration so they can keep it going for a longer period of time. This is the laugh of a bonobo. <laughs> Notice that they keep going. So what does this mean in the animal world? What is the biological purpose of laughter? It is a social signal, usually induced by play or tickling. What does it do? It turns off the fight or flight response. Here is a dog biting the leg of another dog, but he really doesn't mean him any harm. So the, this allows social acceptance of this overtly aggressive act. And so instead of responding with, uh, um, with, with aggression against this, it's allowed. What is the purpose of allowing aggressive acts in play? Because someday that dog may have to kill another dog in order to survive. And this is a practice, but the social group allows it to happen because it, it's non-hostile. It dials back the autonomic responses. Um, when we get to the primates, we get to another level of uh, laughing, sort of proto-humor. Here's Coco the gorilla who learned to sign. She took her uh, handler's uh, file folder, put it on her head and signaled hat. Incongruous labeling of objects. Here's Moja, a chimp who also learned to sign. He put a purse on his foot and called it a shoe. And the, the handler said, uh, who's, who's Mojo? And he said, you are Mojo. Incongruous labeling of actions or objects. This is monkey humor. This is kind of a humor that you see in a two-year-old. So, so in animals, if you add the primates, you get incongruity to the uh, tickling, play, hearing, laughter. And then in humans, we begin to add on more things, defensive laughter, derisive laughter, humor, God help us, we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, Robert Provine was a, one of the real pioneers in this field. He was a stone cold neuroscientist studying neuroendocrine development in fetal cells. He published with Rita Levy Montalcini, the, the Nobel laureate, uh, and he got tired of looking in the microscope. And he figured out that laughter is low hanging fruit. Nobody is studying it. And there's a lot to be learned just by observation and it's not gonna cost too much to do that. And so he and his graduate students went out in the field, quote unquote, meaning to the college cafeteria, to the shopping mall, to places where people gather and started just observing as Darwin did, laughing episodes. And he found some interesting things. People laugh almost, almost never laugh when they're alone. It's always in the context of being with other people. In other words, it's a social emotion. If there is an initiator of the laughing episode and one is the boss and one is the worker, it's the boss that is doing the joking. There is some sort of social dominance in this. He found some, some gender differences in laughing. Men were more likely to be the ones to initiate the joke, but women were more likely to do the laughing. Men seem to be better jokers, but women seem to be better laughers. Is that cultural or is that hardwired? We will return to that in a bit. And curiously, the, as opposed to stand-up comedy, the one most likely to laugh is not the audience, it's the one telling the joke themselves. The one that's saying the, fun, the, the, the laugh comment is the one that is laughing, which means it's affiliative. It, it shows a sign of friendship. In less than 15% of the times that people laughed, was there anything remotely humorous about what they were saying? Think about that. Well. I was uh, recently was on a trip to India and I'm sitting in the airport and here's a guy talking. I don't know if he's talking 
Tamil or Hindu, I'm not sure, but watch. <laughs> now he's laughing, but his buddies aren't. This is what Robert Provine was talking about. I don't even know what he, if he said was even funny. But this is the this is the most common form of laughter that we see on the planet Earth. Affiliative. It says, "Hey, you're my buddy. You're we're, you're part of my crowd. You're my circle." So, what does this do for us? What is the advantage of having this trait? Well, binding of the group. Play. Play allows you to do dangerous activities and social acceptance of what overtly looks hostile. And on the higher level in human beings, permission to broach taboo subjects or to accept bizarre propositions. A gorilla and an antelope walk into a bar. Okay, I mean, you don't say that, that, that couldn't happen. No, no, you accept the problem. Okay, where is, he, where is he going with this? It diffuses tension as we saw in the pupillary experiment, you know, the flight or fright uh, gets turned down. And of course, every biological trait worth its salt that promulgates uh, the species has got to have to do with sexual attraction. Now here is Roger Rabbit. He is married uh, to Jessica Rabbit, who is a bombshell. And the detective, Bob Hoskins, he, he doesn't he doesn't get it. He, what does she see in him? Seriously, what do you see in that guy? He makes me laugh. <laughs> and there have been papers showing that couples that laugh together have a more stable uh, marital relations. Just a brief foray into humor. I know you, you all here, you want to hear jokes and you want to talk about humor, and so do I, but this will bring us far afield. But let's do it anyway, because this is, this is the most fun. A recent uh, article in last week's New York Times, humor is the, a bulwark against complacency and conformity, mediocrity and predictability. Humor is an important trait in, in human cognition. But E.B. White said, analyze, that's the one who wrote Charlotte's Web, analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested and the frog dies of it. Well, let's do a little bit of analysis of humor. Theories of humor. There are basically three and they're not mutually exclusive. The, the parable of the blind men and the elephant, each one sees another aspect of it. No one sees the whole picture, but each one is correct in, from their vantage point. The initial theory of, of, of humor was by Plato and he was against it. He thought of humor as being superiority, laughing at someone, not with someone, but at someone. And he said that in the ideal Republic, we'll have none of that. This theory of humor has been promulgated in some very conservative religions. You know, don't, don't laugh. Don't, even some don't make music. Incongruity, Aristotle and some of the Nordic philosophers, they found that in humor, you have incongruous uh, events or facts that you have to find a way of making sense out of. And they found that was a good thing. It was a very important mental exercise for making sense in the world. And finally, we mentioned Ramachandran's false alarm theory, relief, something, some threat that dissipates. This is what Freud uh, himself uh, felt that uh, this is the super ego reassuring the ego that the world is not dangerous. In other words, bringing up repressed thoughts and feelings and saying, it's okay. Now, Freud himself was a bit of a joker and um, he actually wrote a whole book on the subject, Der Witz und seine Beziehung zum Unbewussten, the, the, the joking and its relationship to the unconsciousness. Jokes are just as dreams are a way into your repressed thoughts and feelings. 
Humor is a complicated subject because there are many different types of humor ranging from physical slapstick humor to wordplay to dark humor about death. It gets complicated. Human humor gets very complicated. Now, at the lowest level, we get slapstick, physical humor. Rock, 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 you know, and you Rock, 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 you know, and you're elephant. Can you sing it? Rock, rock. I'm your elephant. Whoa, <laughs> pop. You can't. Okay, where's the threat? Well, he fell down, you know, but what is the dissipation? Well, he didn't really hurt himself, and we can just laugh on that. A dissipation of a threat. Humor has evolved. If you go back to the earliest mention of not humor, but laughter, I think the earliest is in the Bible. Sarah, Sarah finds out she's 90 years old. She finds out she's pregnant. And according to the King, King James Version, therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have this pleasure? My Lord being also old. She, th this is not funny. This is incongruous. This is an, a 90-year-old having a baby that's in Congress. And the baby is born. And what does she call him? Yitzchak, which comes from the Hebrew root, tzochek, to laugh. But this is not laughter. This is uh, irony. There was a whole stream of um, a profession called court jesters, which I thought was, was only present in European courts. And I was wrong. This goes back to, it's pretty universal. Ancient China and Japan were the first court jesters. India, Africa, even Native American tribes had court jesters. People who were allowed to insult the leader, speak truth to power in a humorous sort of way. Uh, the Greek society, fifth century Greeks, Aristophanes is called the father of comedy. He wrote uh, comedic uh, plays, which uh, morphed over time into Shakespearean comedies and modern sitcoms. The structure of a joke. This is the, the unit of, uh, of comedy. There's a setup. The setup creates tension. And then there's the punchline, which releases the tension. And then there's the butt of the joke, the person that uh, or the object that is uh, being made fun of. Um, I was reluctant to, to, to give you guys any jokes. You can't tell any jokes nowadays. Uh, I think this one will be okay. A friend of mine in California sent it to me last week. Now, let's see the tension in it and let's see the release of it. And then let's see the getting of it. Hi, is this the front desk? Great. Uh, this is Mr. Latham in room 2024. Um, I'm going to need somebody to come up to my room. My wife is hysterical. She's very upset and she's threatening to jump out the window. Yes, this is a personal problem, but the window won't open. So could you send someone for maintenance? Okay, so this is, uh, the tension is he has a problem there. His wife is hysterical. And then they say, well, I know this is a personal, nobody is helping him. And then the flip is he actually wants them to open up the window. Getting it, it means that uh, you see the story one way and then suddenly the story takes a twist and you see it quite another way. Um, I thank Dr. Jacoby for sharing this with me. He has a, he has a whole talk on the use of, uh, of humor in the medical field and he, he talks about four different types of humor. Uh, depending whether the object of the of the of the joke is yourself or someone else, and whether you're saying something positive or negative about it. Let, I'll show you from the masters. Let me show you some examples of each of these. The self-enhancing. The object is the self, and he's saying good things about himself. This is Jackie Mason talking about his uh, then new play on Broadway. It's the biggest sensation in the whole history of New York. I don't think in the history of the world there's been ever such a hit show. <laughs> this is the standing room only every single night, and sometimes it's even when the show is on. <laughs> Self-defeating humor. This is Richard Pryor talking about the time he uh, set himself on fire freebasing cocaine. 
I mean, I was standing there on fire and someone said, well, what's the, are they blue? You know what? That looks like fire! And you know something I found out? When you're on fire and running down the street, people will get out of your way. Now, here is with the butt of the joke of someone else, and you're saying something nice about them. This is Groucho Marx with, his, uh, with Margaret Dumont. Will you marry me? Did he leave you any money? Answer the second question first. <laughs> he left me his entire fortune. Is that so? Can't you see what I'm trying to tell you? I love you. Oh, your excellency. You're not so bad yourself. Now, aggressive or put down humor. This is where the object is someone else and you're saying bad things about them. And the master of that was Don Rickles, Mr. Warmth. Kid, no, I know your parents. By the way, I want to say hello to Jeff. Uh, I'm the only guy that ever brings that up. Hi, mom and dad. The check was delayed, but <laughs> you will have to live in the pickup for another month. <laughs> He has the nicest parents, but he keeps his personal life quiet. And I know your personal life and continue on. <laughs> and as we will see in a few moments, each one of these subtypes of humor is wired differently in the brain. I mean, I was was now let's go to stand-up comedy. That's what we think of in this present day and age. Uh, humor has to do with stand-up. Uh, individual on the stage with a microphone. What I didn't realize is this is actually a very new art form. It's culturally sophisticated. It didn't exist until very recently. It evolved up from the com comics who talked at minstrel shows and vaudeville, but the very first club devoted strictly to stand-up was, was in the danger fields on First Avenue in 1969. Before that, there was no such thing as a comedy club. And here are the pioneers of stand-up. Uh, we can see on the left, these are the early ones and the later ones over time. Invariably, all of them were Jewish. Almost all of them were from New York. They practiced their skills in the hotels of the Catskills, the so-called Borscht Belt, or they were African-American and they uh, practiced their skills in the clubs of uh, the Chitlin circuit around the country. Uh, and over the course of time, television came out and their voices were heard nationwide. And this became an American phenomena, stand-up comedy. A couple of, if you've had a, the opportunity to hear any of these folks, you've been blessed because this was the golden age of American comedy. But I must warn you that if you look here, it's a dangerous profession. Here is Lenny Bruce being arrested for using words that you hear every single day of the week on cable TV. And here is Chris Rock being smacked by Will Smith for telling a joke about Will Smith's wife that Will Smith did not appreciate. See, comedy, the, the, the setting up, the setup of the joke, you have to make people uncomfortable. And sometimes you make them so uncomfortable you cross a line. And where that line is uh, changes from society to society. To society. And uh, in this day and age, I think people have a very uh, short line that you can cross. Everybody is kind of like upset about everything these days. But this phenomena of stand-up has spread throughout the world. Like in repressive societies such as Nigeria, it is a way out, a way of discussing you know, uh, tough issues that you, you you are being repressed. So in Nigeria and recently in India, I asked the people, do you have stand-up comedy clubs? We're starting to get them. And here they see them, Africa, South America, all over the world. So this art form has arrived. It's not that only Jewish people can do it. No, they, they created it, but all people can do it. Just like jazz, black people invented jazz and then other people learned how to do it too. Where? Where are the clinical lesions in, in laughter? I mean, where, where is the circuit, the circuitry of laughter? And we, can, we find that from various sources, clinical lesions, brain stimulations, and functional imaging. 
Now we're gonna be talking about clinical cases later. We'll learn a little bit more, but let's start off with a very simple clinical case. This is a guy who's had a stroke and he has a left, a mild left hemiparesis and his face, he has a central seventh parasis of his face. Can you smile for me? Can you smile as best as you can? Tell me something funny. Huh? So, okay, no, just do that. I don't want you, not something funny. I just want you to just a regular smile. Okay, smile as good as you can. That's the best you the can do. Her face. Okay, now, now what I'm going to do is, I see this pen? Mm -hmm. I'm going to stick it up my nose. Watch this. Yeah, okay. Okay. That's a good one, right? <laughs> not fooling me. Yes, I am. I'm going to do it there. Uh, yes, I am. Good. Yes, I am. Very good. Okay, so you see that his facial paresis was cured by a joke. Can you? Conversely, this patient had the opposite problem, a right frontal stroke, uh, had a, a normal volitional smile, but the emotional smile was impaired. This double dissociation was uh, presented in a New England Journal uh, article some time ago. The lower one is the patient with a stroke. And you see that they have the impaired uh, right side of the face, but with, a, with smiling, it, it's preserved. Whereas the uh, deep lesion uh, in the thalamus, equal volitional smile, but emotional smiling is down on the right side. What does that imply? It implies that emotional smile and volitional smile are projected through separate motor systems. Uh, the emotional smile is thought to come from thalamus down to the periactive ductal gray and then to uh, dorsal tegmentum. Volitional smile is the normal cortical pontine pathways. And that there are certain muscles, particularly around the eyes, that are under emotional control and you don't have control of them through the volitional networks. You can't fake a smile. Hypomimia, Parkinson's disease, they have trouble with facial expressions of all kinds. And I'm just gonna mention in passing, it's a two way street. If you can't smile, you feel depressed. If you're depressed, you can't smile. Parkinson's disease has 10 times the incidence of depression. Uh, not all of that is because of the lack of facial expression. Some of that is organic, but it's part of it. And this is an interesting study. Um, look, uh, Mergel looked at 25 patients who had depression in Parkinson's um, and they were being treated. Um, if they looked at their emotional smile, if there was slowness, of elevation of the left side of the face to humor. It was a marker for major depression and suicidality. One of the earliest uh, groups to try to localize humor was Shami and Stuss who did an interesting experiment. They looked at stroke patients. They broke the brain into four quadrants, left and right, front and back and found only the right frontal quadrant had problems appreciating humorous statements. And when they had to fill out what is the most humorous uh, line to uh, multiple choice, when, what makes this line funny or what makes this cartoon funny, they had e substantial errors. The right front of the brain seemed to be very important for humor. Well, that makes sense because the right front of the brain is able to contain two different versions of reality at the same time. Uh, for example, when I was in India, one of the temples I saw, here are two, a man and a woman, two people, but three legs. Does this middle leg belong to the man or does it belong to the woman? Or does it belong to the man or does it belong? You can see it's two different ways uh, or, or this sort of, uh, uh, visual, uh, is this a young woman with a little nose or is this an old woman with a big nose and an eye? An, a young woman, an old woman. Um, 
that's what the frontal lobes do. And that's important for humor. Now, in terms of stimulation uh, of, of laughter, the first one to mechanically, quote unquote, tickle the brain was Otfried Forster in Germany, who here you see him uh, with uh, Harvey Cushing, who was one of his students. Uh, he was swabbing the floor of the third ventricle during surgery and the patient under anesthesia laughed. Well, what is sitting under the floor of the third ventricle? The hypothalamus. And that was the, the first indication that hypothalamus is a major node in the laughing circuits. Electrical stimulation have evoked laughter from various parts of the brain, anterior cingulate, orbitofrontal, prefrontal, dorsolateral, um, temporal basal, uh, and then deeper structures, amygdala, hypothalamus, globus pallidus. Here is a typical uh, case study by Yitzhak Fried out of UCLA, a, a surgeon who does epilepsy surgery. They're trying to map out the brain for epilepsy surgery. And every time the young woman, she was a teenager, was zapped in these red areas, she would laugh. This is in the frontal lobe on the left-hand side. And of course, this is done without anesthesia. And Fried said to her, is something funny? And she said, yeah, you're Thai. I mean, that's how the mind works. You know, she back justifies why she's feeling this is so funny. Your tie is hilarious. One of the major ways we've been able to discern the circuits is with functional imaging. Uh, now, there, in order to do this, you have to get the, the subject to laugh. And there are different ways of doing that. One is with tickling. And if we do tickling, you can see a circuit that starts off in the parietal areas, that's the sensory uh, parietal operculum. Uh, that's uh, the uh, sensory portion of it. But then it feeds forward to emotional circuits, amygdala, insular, medial, frontal, and then the display, hypothalamus down to the periactal gray to the cerebellum. The insular seems to be a very important node in the laugh circuit. Uh, in fact, uh, Wattendorf found that there's a little area in the insula that responds only to being tickled with laughter. If they, somebody just fake laughed, it didn't work. Or if they were tickled and they inhibited the laugh, it didn't work. You had to actually laugh in order for this little piece of insula to light up. And she said, hence our data strengthens the hypothesis that smiling and laughter not only represent different degrees of pleasant emotional expressions, but are fundamentally different from each other. So as, Dar as Darwin said, laughter is just in children, just uh, uh, overflow of joy. No, it's more than that. It has a different circuitry than just smiling. Um, hearing laughter can, can evoke uh, uh, laughter in others. And if you use that as a stimulus, you find superior temporal, which is the input for hearing. Again, insular cortex lights up. What is this about the insular cortex that's so important? Well, it, it's a structure that stands in between sensory, motor, and limbic system. The posterior portion of it receives interoceptive data, in other words, how your body is feeling. And the mid portion connects to emotional circuits, the nucleus accumbens, amygdala, hypothalamus, ventral, uh, medial prefrontal areas. And the anterior connects to cortical areas, looking at higher level uh, emotions, so-called feelings, conscious appraisal and, and awareness of what you're feeling. Here's uh, uh, Watson worked at uh, the highest level, uh, humor. And uh, she looked at uh, uh, language-based, this was done with cartoons, language-based and visual. Some of them are funny because the words are funny. Some of them because the pictures are funny. And of course they get processed differently. Language gets processed in language cortex in the left brain. Visual gets processed in higher order visual centers, but they all feed down to a common pathway. Getting the joke, the frontoinsular to the anterior uh, cortex and reward systems, amygdala, nucleus accumbens, 
and uh, then the display, hypothalamus substantia nigra periactal gray. Now this, this frontal, frontal insular cingulate, anterior cingulate, this keeps coming up in all of the studies. That's a very important node in the laugh circuit. They are loaded with what are called von Economo cells, named for Constantine von Economo, who was a uh, student of Oppenheim and Alzheimer's. Uh, he was also uh, von, Econo, von Economo's encephalitis, you know that, uh, the, the flu epidemic. Uh, what, you, what I didn't know is he also was a very rich guy. His parents were rich, a Macedonian family, and he had his own plane back in the 1920s. Here he is with uh, his little pilot costume. He defined cells that were much bigger than pyramidal cells, very fast conducting, but very little arborization in the dendrites. These are found in exactly the places that we talk about for laughter, frontoinsular, dorsolateral prefrontal, and the cingulate. Uh, these are large bipolar cells. They're phylogenetically very new. 15 million years is new in this business. And they're found in and only in creatures with high develop, highly developed brains, humans, apes, elephants, whales, dolphins. They conduct very rapidly. They come from layer five of one cortex and go to layer five of another cortex. They seem to be comparing outputs. And they have been implicated in fast intuitive decisions, empathy, recognition of errors, and importantly, cognitive dissonance, disambiguation between A and B. As we saw in the joke, you see things one way, then suddenly you see it another way. They've been called the air traffic controllers of emotions, and they're lost in frontotemporal, but not in Alzheimer's disease. And these seem to be very important to the phase of getting the joke. Now, if you take a look at uh, this group uh, took, um, had subjects watch Seinfeld or The Simpsons, and they took the, a laugh track, and then they time locked the fMRI study to when the, the laughing began. Two seconds before the laughing began, they called that humor detection. And then when the people started laughing, humor appreciation. And what they found was the detection, this is uh, was in the temporal and frontal, they found the left dominance here, but then the so-called appreciation or the getting of the joke, insular amygdala lit up. You see, when you hear a joke, there are two phases of getting it. One is you get the emotional response and that, oh, ha, ha, ha. And that is a very deep subcortical. And then there is a, a secondary response where you sort of... Uh, cerebrate on it, you think about it a, a little bit more, and that is a cortical processing of, of the joke. And it seems to, that there are gender differences, hardwired gender differences between men and women in appreciating uh, humor. Women, both men and women had the, uh, uh, there's a dorsal system, which is the subcortical and uh, deep, and then there's the cortical system. Women are, have a much more robust ventral system. They have, uh, that happens in men and women, but women have stronger signals, amygdala, insula, prefrontal, um, and stronger reward signals. They enjoy humor, I don't know if that interpret, you can interpret that, but they have stronger reward signals where men, Although they do use the ventral system, they they go to the dorsal system, which is where they cerebrate. They think about it, hippocampus, dorsal, uh, the dorsal portion uh, of the ACC and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Why do men think about humor? Did they emote less, but they think more? Is it because they're the jokers and they have to go look at this for future reference? Or is it because men know if they laugh inappropriately, it can lead to violence and they hold back? I'm not sure the biology of this, but there is a biological difference. If we look at the four styles of humor that we discussed before, it turns out that they're also wired differently. The humor that has to do with yourself, either whether it's in self-enhancing or self-defeating, starts off 
at the temporal pole, whereas humor directed toward others start at the temporal parietal junction. And this is uh, consistent with the theory of mind. The temporal parietal junction is important for you to understand that someone else is human and has the same emotions that you do. So the temporal pole seems to be the me, and the temporal parietal junction seems to be the beginning of understanding the other. Benign humor, whether it's yourself or the other person as the target, takes a high road, the cortical road, whereas aggressive humor, uh, whether it's about yourself or others, takes a deeper route, amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. And all of these feed down to a common display in the nucleus accumbens where you get the little squirt of dopamine and the midbrain where you get the display. Summary. So initially, uh, humor or tickling or, is, or hearing laughter is processed in uh, language centers or core sensory areas, but then feeds down to a common system. A appreciation is we getting the joke has to do with frontoinsular and uh, anterior cingulate. This is the salient system. Is this important? Is it not important? And then feeds down to limbic structures orbitofrontal, again, insular amygdala, and then feeds back to regulation. It goes back to cortical areas. It takes another look at it and extracts more uh, higher level information from it. Finally, it all goes down to get your little dopamine reward in the nucleus accumbens, ventral striatum, and then the display, the uh, motor, uh, final motor components, hypothalamus down to the upper brainstem. Finally, what we've all been waiting for, case studies. Let's take what we've learned about humor and laughter and apply them to clinical cases in neurology. Yes. Gelastic seizures. These are seizures that have the, the display of laughter. Here's a kid being monitored in the epilepsy unit. Watch his face here in the lower right. And the EEG is suddenly going, and there you go. He's laughing. He's laughing. This is his seizure. And is it good laughing? It's good laughing. It looks like good laughing. Does he feel that something is funny? Probably not. Where does this come from? Well, hypothalamus in most cases, classically hypothalamic hematoma. And when the seizure comes from the hypothalamus, it doesn't, you don't think of it as being funny. But sometimes in higher cortical areas, temporal or frontal, then the person will say that, yes, it was funny. Here's something that is commonly seen in, uh, in stroke neurology uh, and in ALS. Uh, it's called pathological laughter, pseudobulbar laughter, emotional continence. The, it keeps changing its name. The, the, the most recent one I've heard, involuntary emotional expression disorder. Let's just see what it is, uh, regardless of how we name it. So here's a guy, he's had multiple lacunar strokes. With them. And every time I take his blood pressure, this happens. No, no, what, what's funny about the blood pressure? <laughs> you know, when somebody <laughs> laughs at everybody around him, that's not a laugh. He's <laughs> now let me ask you: When you're laughing out, do you feel like it's funny that you didn't come to No, it's, it's, it's not funny, but you, but you have to laugh anyway. Okay. with them. Whenever I show these old videotapes, the residents are shocked that I looked like this before, and I'm not because I still think I look like that. With them. Okay, these pa pathological laughter, stereotypical episodes of uncontrollable laughter and it's not they don't it's not funny incongruent with the feeling of mirth and the stimulate stimulation for is not nothing that the humorous in this case i just took his blood pressure it's socially embarrassing and it is uh, seen in about 15% uh, of patients with multiple strokes and half of the people with als what is the wiring diagram for this? It's usually corticospinal, corticobulbar tracts in a, one of the early 
uh, explorations of, uh, of laughter in the brain. Puck in the Vinken and Brun handbook in 1969 did pathological studies of patients with pathological laughter. All of them, 30 out of 30 had lesions in the anterior limb of the internal capsule. That's a structure we don't talk about. We're always talking about posterior limb and motor deficits. Anterior limb seems to be the, the, the fibers that suppress emotions. And if you, if you take them out, you get the unsuppressed laughter. This is a treat, it, this is a socially disfiguring disorder. People are not happy that they're laughing inappropriately. And it's treated with tricyclic SSRIs. And there is a combination drug, dexamethorphan quinidine, which uh, has been approved for this indication. Here's a patient with end stage dementia. She doesn't speak. She doesn't interact with, the, with, with, the, with her family. All she does is this. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> she laughs, but it's not a funny laugh. It's a pained laugh. It's almost a cry at times. It morphs between the two. I call this the uh, the Cheshire cat syndrome. In Alice in Wonderland, when the Cheshire cat disappeared, all that was left was its smile. Well, that's all that's left with her, of her cognition is the laughing program. And this is seen in mo many kinds of end-stage dementia, particularly Kuru. I had the honor of hearing Carlton Gadjusek talk about his expedition to New Guinea. And before the patients uh, succumbed to Kuru, they would just start laughing and it was called the laughing death. You know. Here's something interesting, a Witzelzucht. This was first described by Hermann Oppenheim. He was the uh, son of the rabbi of Vorburg, Germany. And you know him from Oppenheim, Sign and many other neurological, he was a major neurologist in the 1800s. He, des he described four cases of right frontal tumor, where the patient had compulsive joking, often inappropriate, sexual in nature. And yet, if you tried to get them to laugh with a, with a joke, they had an impaired sense of humor. The only thing they laughed at was their own jokes, and they were unaware of how inappropriate it was. And this was, you can see this with frontotemporal dementia, intracranial hemorrhage, it requires two things. Impairment of the sense of humor is damage to the right lateral frontal uh, lobe and then disinhibition. That's more medial. Here's two interesting cases. One 69 year old with a subarachnoid hemorrhage 10 years ago had a, uh, a shunt placed and uh, was doing well until five years later had this small lacoon and all of a sudden developed Witzelzucht inappropriate laughing and hoarding behaviors. You need this one-two punch. This set the stage and then this took the inhibition off. Uh, here's a more co common case, frontotemporal dementia affecting the right front of the brain, inappropriate joking, sexual in nature and, and dementia. If you're gonna remember one syndrome, it's this one because it's very rare, but you have to know about it. Um, and I think that this should be put on the NIH stroke scale with 10 points if you have this. Listen to this. Here's a guy, he's 84 years old. He used to write plays for Broadway. And now he is at home. He's had a stroke in the past. He, he's, uh, he's, he's in a wheelchair, but he can walk. And he's with his wife. They're getting ready to go to the to try on the suit for his grandson's bar mitzvah. Tell us what happened the day he was trying the suit on for the bar mitzvah. Uh, he had been in the living room and uh, in his wheelchair, put on new jackets, and then we walked down a little short hallway to a mirror. Uh, and he, he got to the mirror, and I asked him to back up so he could see a little better, and he couldn't move his feet. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what was wrong, and he started laughing. Laughing. He, he 
was unable to move, he was unable to talk, and every time I asked him anything, he would laugh. He would laugh. How long did those the laughing jag continue every time you were? Well, this whole uh, about a five minute process. Five minutes. Okay, so he suddenly laughed and they brought him to the emergency room and he was back to baseline. They just found some old strokes on CAT scan. They sent him home. The next morning, he was found to be not moving his right side. He had this relatively small stroke, but he remained stuporous and hemiplegic, no seizures on EEG, and he died. And he never went to his grandson's bar mitzvah. This is called Fourier prodromique first described by Charles Ferre, uncontrollable laughter that heralds a stroke. Within seconds to even 24 hours later, the patient has a major stroke and they either die or they wind up locked in. And the localization is again, of the motor pathways. The last syndrome is cataplexy. This is if you tickle them, they lose their muscle tone and they fall to the ground. There's a patient of mine. Sometimes when you just start to laugh and a hard laugh. Yeah. And you just kill over. They suddenly lose muscle tone. And if you look at the uh, sudden loss of motor atonia, uh, and what precipitates it in most cases, laughing, making a sharp remark, telling a joke before reaching the punchline of a joke, tickling. You, la laughter program seems to be the major uh, um, cause of the cataplectic attack. Now, what is going on here? Why do they look, get motor atonia? Well, here's a little clue. If you take a normal person and you make them laugh in the laboratory, you'll get a 90% reduction in the amplitude of the H reflex. This happens in normal people that you lose your muscle tone when you're laughing. This may be the cause of weak with laughter, rolling in the aisles. And here's basically the cartoon. There's an erection system coming down from the hypothalamus. This is excitatory in blue. And when you go into REM sleep, it's inhibitory. You turn off the motor system by sending fibers to the spinal cord, neuro neuromuscular junction. Now, in the normal waking state, the system is biased toward excitation and inhibition is turned off. But in narcolepsy, the orexin is an autoimmune attack against orexin and the system is biased toward the inhibitory side of the system so that any emotional inputs go toward complete inhibition and you lose all your muscle tone. Finally, two words, uh, laughter as medicine, coping with Parkinson's disease. Um, first of all, general population studies, 14,000 patients in Japan showed that those who never laugh die. They become disabled and they die. And the more you laugh, the less likely you become disabled or dead. If you laugh less than once a day, you're gonna have an increased risk of stroke cardiac disease, mortality, and can you intervene? Can you change that? Yes, you can. Here's a small study, 235, uh, laughing yoga, uh, you decrease BMI, stress and depression, 12 weeks watching comedy videos, 10% uh, increase in cardiac function. Uh, here's a meta-analysis of 45 such studies using as stimulation, laugh yoga, laugh therapy, clown therapy, passively watching funny videos of over 2000 patients, improvements in mental health and physiological outcomes. Uh, I have to thank Johannes for this. Uh, uh, he said, this guy, uh, Bella Chu Germa holds the world record for nonstop laughing for three hours and six minutes. And he set up a laughing school in Addis Ababa. And what does that tell us? It tells us that yes, Johannes does know everything. Why, how does it work? How does laughter help you? Well, you find that uh, patients exposed to laughter have decreased stress hormones and improved immune functions. Take home points and we're right on time, beautiful. 
Uh, social laughter is more common than humor. Humor is not what laughter is all about. It's affiliative. It's to make friends with people, to share experiences. Emotion and volition use parallel motor systems. You cannot fake a laugh. It has to be, you can't get to those muscles volitionally. Feelings and emotions may be dissociated in pathological states, such as in pathological laughter. Uh, pathological laughter is socially uh, isolating and should be treated, and there's treatment for it. Laughter is a prominent sign or triggering mechanism for a number of neurological diseases. And beware the laughing stroke. That that's ten should be ten points on the uh, on the NIH. You know that means this is a serious stroke on the way. Uh, laughter provides a, a probe into how the brain is orga organized. And finally, laughter is good medicine. You should not deny yourself laughter. And I think that, that's it. I, oh, well, one last thing. Um, a lot of what I said is presented in a, a very nice humorous form in this film called Laughology. And we uh, actually interview some of the major researchers in the field. It, it's, it's available for free, I think, on Netflix or YouTube or somewhere. And, th and thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Spar. This was a very... Uh, entertaining and very insightful presentation. Um, anybody who has a question, they can uh, unmute themselves or maybe type it in the chat. Um, question, Steve, it's Howard. Um, could you talk about the role of timing? I mean, comedians say they work for years on their timing. And I noticed during COVID when the comedians were doing their routines from their basement, it wasn't as funny. They they needed the feedback from the audience, even the silent feedback, in order to, to be as funny. So whatever comments you have about timing and human interaction for, for comedy. That, that's really quite astute, yes. It, it, this is an interaction, just even with the horses where it's a call response system. You know, you want to quote unquote, feel your audience. You want to, the timing uh, is something that's sort of more instinctual. You can't build, uh, maybe in these days of AI, they'll figure it out, but we can't. The only way to do it, the timing has to, be, has to be felt. So for example, today, this lecture, I felt in isolation here. I, I, I couldn't feel you guys. And it was a little bit inhibiting for me. Uh, I only did it because I had these, uh, my, my biggest nightmare was showing up in the lecture hall and, and the videos don't work. And they're so important to show the videos. But yes, you're absolutely right, timing. Um, and, uh, you know, everything is on Zoom nowadays and, and we lose so much of in per and, and patient encounters. I like to say, I want to smell my patients. I don't really mean to say that I want to smell my patients, but I want to feel my patients. You pick up these emotional cues, these subtle emotional cues by being face to face with the patient. Thank you for that observation. It's true. Well, I uh, I thank you all for you for your your kind attention. I hope you look at laughter now as not just some sideshow, but it's something very integral to what makes us human and has applications to every field that you're interested in. Keep laughing. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.